that two really bad things would have happened. One of them is that we would not have any kind of a civilian space program at all. We might never have gone to the moon, etc. Um, and worse, we might have militarized space. We might have vehicles up there carrying you know, nuclear payloads ready to drop on everybody's heads. And that would be worse than mutually assured you know, destruction, uh, which is the policy during the Cold War. Uh, so Eisenhower, as I look back on it now, uh, was incredibly uh, insightful, I think, in recognizing the potential threat of moving down a purely military path. So when he created the Advanced Research Projects Agency in the wake of the Sputnik launch, I guess it started January of 58, but I don't remember the details, uh, and at the time, I didn't know anything about it. I mean, DARPA was a, a thing that I'd never heard of until I actually went to work there, so to speak. Um, but DARPA got started to get us into space. But it was the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and not long after DARPA, or called ARPA at the time, initiated that space uh, program, the, uh, the military-industrial complex concerns that President Eisenhower had drew him to take that program out of the Defense Department and create NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, precisely to make sure it was in civilian control. This is absolutely consistent with the way the United States government is set up. The military is under the control of a civilian, not under the control of a military person. After NASA was spun out of ARPA, there was a question, what should it do? ARPA was created in part to prevent another technological surprise from happening to the United States military. And so the idea behind ARPA was to explore high-risk, high-payoff technologies and possibilities to make sure we understood what could be done, what is doable, what threats might there be if somebody else did something if we didn't. Um, in, the, in that general area, a man named J.C.R. Licklider at MIT was asked to create something called the Information Processing Techniques Office of ARPA. And he did this, I don't remember exactly when, might be 1962, but my recollections here are not trustable. Um, but he was actually a psychologist, not a computer scientist and not an electrical engineer. He was very interested in how computers could be used by people for non-numeric purposes. He understood that computers could be communication devices. He even wrote a famous memo to some of his uh, colleagues suggesting that we should be com connecting these computers together in some kind of a network, and he made jocular reference to his intergalactic network. Well, of course, there, there are now some, looking in, uh, in perspective, there are some very important uh, things going on today which are very relevant to what his you know, rather over, uh, overstatement about intergalactic communication. His idea, though, was to create networks of computers to use these things for non-numerical purposes. The ARPANET was the first such uh, wide area network, and it was based on a concept called packet switching. Interestingly enough, three different people came up with the same basic ideas in, at slightly different times. Leonard Kleinrock at um, MIT was developing a theory of how you analyze store and forward communication. He didn't call it packet switching, it was message, uh, stochastic message flow. Uh, Paul Barron at Rand Corporation in 1962 came up with this, an idea for doing what he called message blocks, but it was packet switching, only he was trying to build a voice communication system that would be survivable in the face of a nuclear attack. So he needed a very general mesh network in which uh, hot potato random routing would happen, where you would say something, it would be digitized, turned into packets, and then flooded through the network to get to the other side. He wrote an 11-volume uh, description of this called On Distributed Communication, and then in the early 60s, another guy named uh, Donald W. Davies at the National Physical Laboratory of England uh, invented the term packet switching and built a one-node packet switch. So all these guys worked independently of each other. ARPA eventually decided it was going to build such a network. A guy named Larry Roberts, who was at Lincoln Laboratory, was brought to ARPA and asked to run this program by Bob Taylor, who had inherited the role of the director of the IPTO office from J.C.R. Licklider. 
and uh, Larry focused on what he called resource sharing, which is to try to get the computers that were used in the computer science departments that ARPA was sponsoring research at to link their computers together so they could share software and hardware. They couldn't afford to buy a new computer for every you know, computer science department that they were supporting. So they said, why don't you share them? Why don't you take, you know, use other people's resources? So they built the ARPANET, and I was lucky enough to have a small part in the, uh, in the construction of that system. Uh, actually, you need to step back for a second and understand something about the uh, people who built the network, the ARPANET and the subsequent Internet. Uh, we were computer scientists. We were not communications engineers. We were mostly interested in software and programming and making computers do things. This is like creating a little universe of your own. It's a program is, is whatever does whatever you tell it to do, mostly. I mean, sometimes you don't realize you told it to do something you didn't want it to do. That's called a bug. Uh, but the idea that you could create this little universe and do whatever you want to with it was very beguiling, which is why I got so interested in computers and programming. The idea that you could actually do something remotely was even more beguiling. I mean, you could make it by doing something to this computer, you caused another computer thousands of miles away to do something. Wow, that's cool. And if you get a bunch of them working together to do something, that's even more cool. So the idea of building this network and being able to share resources and to interact with each other remotely and get pro programs to talk to each other was enormously fascinating. It was very exciting. 